السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ جزاک اللہ خیرن فار جوائننگ اکنا کاؤنسل فار سوشل جسٹس کیلیفورنیا چیپٹر ویبینار آن اسلامک اسٹیٹ اینڈ ویل پلاننگ ایز یو نو ڈیتھ از پروبیبلی دی موسٹ سرٹن تھنگ فار آل پیپل ان دا ورلڈ نو میٹر واٹ ریلیجس بیک گراؤنڈ اور کلچرل پرسویشن اور بلیفس اے پرسن کمس فرام death is something that cannot be denied. Preparation for that includes several aspects from financial, funeral arrangement, arrangement for families, for those a person leaves behind, um, businesses, a um, lot of uh, things, a lot of areas that need to be covered. One of the most important part of this is having the knowledge and information of the law of the land. What does the local law talk about estate planning? What can you do and what uh, you cannot under the local law? And what are the practical measures you can take to ensure that you can safeguard your planning based on the law? And for this, we have an amazing speaker who's one of the foremost experts on this in this field Hafid Yasser Ali um, from the Bay Area from California who has done several of these uh, webinars before he will be talking about uh, preparation the practical aspects of preparation however he will not stop uh, start from uh, uh, just the legal aspect but the Islamic concepts, the Islamic background, the fifty concepts that are out there. However, um, we strongly encourage you to seek further confirmation, further knowledge from um, your local scholars, um, uh, whether be it online or your masajid or so on. But uh, this presentation, inshallah, will cover all of those aspects but focusing mainly on the on the legal aspect so we have alhamdulillah a huge number of uh, people who have already registered uh, we have received uh, over uh, hundreds of uh, questions we may not be able to uh, get to all the questions but we will try as much as possible uh, we have received questions via email through our registration system facebook youtube live and so on and we i'm sure we will continue to receive a lot Uh, over the duration of the presentation. So um, uh, the, this uh, presentation is going to be recorded and um, for any further information that any other questions that you may have uh, regarding the presentation or regarding uh, the organizers, please feel free to email uh, ca at iknacsj.org which is Cal the California chapter of ICNA Council for Social Justice. And without further ado, I uh, present to you Brother uh, Yasser Ali uh, as our uh, main presenter, or speaker for the uh, presentation. Brother Yasser. Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma allimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima allamtana wa zidna min fadlika ilman ya rabbal alameen. Uh, first off, welcome to everybody. We had some uh, technical difficulties getting started, but uh, inshallah, I hope everybody can see. Uh, thank you for joining. Um, it looks like there's people from all over the country, mashallah, and some international guests as well. Uh, so uh, in this blessed month of Ramadan, it's a, a really important topic. And you know, the title we talked about was uh, one in which we're thinking about estate planning and What does that entail, you know, protecting our family, leaving a legacy after we pass away and uh, fulfilling our religious obligations? So that's probably the, the, the scope of why you came uh, to this webinar. Uh, but I want to give you some more motivation as to how valuable your time is today, inshallah, in this presentation. Uh, the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, he says in a hadith, he says, ta'allamu al-fara'id. 
He says, learn and teach the rules of inheritance for verily they're half of all knowledge. I mean, subhanAllah, if you look through our tradition, you won't uh, find this type of virtue given to other areas of knowledge, half of all knowledge. And the scholars, they explain this hadith and they give different um, explanations about why half of knowledge. Uh, one of the explanations is ta'lima and just to show its grandeur, show how uh, important and significant and weighty this area of knowledge is. Um, others, they mention that all of the things you learn in your life, everything that you learn in your life, it has to do with stuff that you're responsible for while you're alive. Meaning salah, zakah, tahara, hajj, everything. Everything you learn within our Islamic tradition, you're going to have to do while you're alive. The only thing that you have to do after death is ensure that your wealth is distributed properly. And so half of the stuff you can learn has to do with pre-death and half has to do with post-death. And the Prophet ﷺ continues in the hadith, he says, وَهُوَ yunsa." It will be forgotten. This knowledge will be forgotten. And if we think about it, and I guess this webinar, mashallah, uh, to the, the brothers at Ikna that organized this, had the foresight to think about, this is a really important topic for people, one that they don't have the... Uh, exposure to, right? If we think about all of the halaqas, all of the khutbas that we've heard in our lifetime, we haven't had this topic addressed. Uh, for most of us, you know, we may never have attended a presentation, a seminar, now a webinar in light of COVID. And we ask Allah to have mercy on us and to allow us to gather again in his masajid and to embrace one another and to bring things back like they used to be. Uh, but وَهُوَ يُنْسَى And the Prophet ﷺ says, أَوَّلُ شَيْءٍ يُنْزَعُ مِنْ أُمَّتِي أَوْ كَمَا قَالُ It will be the first knowledge that will be lifted from my ummah. So there's a really important uh, area of Islamic law that we're going to be talking about today. One more hadith and then we'll dive into the topic at hand. And that is, uh, as an extra motivation, we know in Ramadan that our deeds are multiplied. Right? Ramadan is the very special time in which our deeds are multiplied. There's a famous hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in which he tells Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu, a famous sahabi, he says to Abu Dhar that if you go out, لَن تَغْدُوا فَتَعَلَّمَ آيَةً مِنْ كِتَابِ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنْ أَن تُصَلِّيَ مِئَةَ رَكَعَةً If you learn one ayah of Qur'an, it's better for you than praying a hundred rak'at of optional prayer. One ayah of Qur'an. And then he goes further, he says, وَلَن تَغْدُوا فَتَعَلَّمَ بَابًا مِنَ الْعِلْمِ عُمِلَ بِهِ أَوْ لَمْ يُعْمَلْ بِهِ that if you learn a chapter of knowledge, a chapter of knowledge, right? And this could constitute a chapter of knowledge. Now, Islamic inheritance law is one of the most advanced topics in Islamic law. So we're only gonna, you know, just to have a cursory overview in our time today. But nonetheless, if we, if this counts, inshallah, as an introduction to a chapter of knowledge, and the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, عُمِلَ بِهِ أَوْ لَمْ يُعْمَلْ بِهِ Whether you implement it or you don't. Right, And so the example the ulama give is like tayammum. You learn how to do tayammum and you uh, might not necessarily implement it. Now the goal and the hope and the advice that I'm going to give you today is that we should implement what we're learning. We should take proactive steps to create a plan, uh, an estate plan, because that's the only way it's going to encapsulate and memorialize our wishes. Nonetheless, whether you implement it or you don't, if you leave here with learning a new area of knowledge it's better than praying a thousand rak'at of optional prayers subhanallah so think about that think about ramadan think about if you're missing the masjid you're missing taraweeh right you have the ability here in this hour that we spend together to you know earn more reward than potentially all of the taraweeh that we would be praying of course don't stop praying taraweeh uh, but this just shows the virtue of what we are discussing here today, insha'Allah. So um, let's start with, uh, let's start with, let's get my screen up here. An overview. So what are we gonna be covering today? So we have about an hour, insha'Allah, together. I'm going to try to uh, be somewhat uh, comprehensive, but also brief in uh, my remarks so that we have enough time for Q&A. And I know that there's a lot of questions that have already been submitted, mashallah, 
uh, I have never done a, a presentation with so many questions that came in in advance of the presentation. Uh, so uh, inshallah, people have a lot of interest in the topic and we'll try to cover it uh, and then uh, take as many of the questions as we reasonably can within the time inshallah today. So we're gonna talk about what is estate planning, right? It's important to understand the technical definition, right? If you don't think you have an estate, well then why are we even here, right? So who needs an estate plan? And then what makes a plan Islamic, right? So we're going to cover Islamic inheritance, Islamic estate planning. What does that mean? You know, can I just prepare a will, put that halal stamp on it, and then say it's good? Or is there something more to it? And then what are the, we're going to shift from a theoretical into a practical. So we're going to talk about estate planning as a concept. We're going to talk about Islamic inheritance law as a theoretical framing of what we need to do. And then we're going to bring it to practical level. How do I go about doing that? What type of documents do I need to prepare? And how do I prepare those documents? Now, I know there's people from all over the country uh, joining us today, mashallah. Uh, and there's some people I saw uh, from overseas as well. And so just so you know, this is uh, general advice. Okay, this is not intended to be specific legal advice. We're giving general advice about uh, topics that you're going to need to follow up with and on. Uh, so don't take what I say here and then uh, consider it to be uh, you know, necessarily binding in your specific situation, but this is general advice that we're giving uh, that hopefully has some benefit to everyone that's listening here today, inshallah. And then as I said, we'll take questions and answers or we'll try to share some answers, inshallah. So to get started, we want to start with this question of what's an estate. You know, when you study any knowledge, any subject, the, uh, with, whether it's fiqh from an Islamic perspective or you're studying, uh, you know, law or science or math or, 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 you know, medicine, the first thing that we cover are definitions, right? So often I introduce myself, uh, I tell my friends and, and, and people that I meet, I say, I'm an estate planning attorney, okay? So they say, oh, mashallah, that's really cool. I'll tell my friend. Because they assume, you know, I don't have an estate. My friend who's very wealthy has an estate, but I don't have an estate, right? So most people, when they think of the word estate, they think of something like this, right? Like a, an estate, <laughs> you know, a castle, something maybe in Britain uh, or England or Europe somewhere, uh, not something that impacts me. But the reality of an estate, to simplify it, it means your stuff, right? Everything you own. So it could be your house, it could be your car, it could be uh, for our sisters, it could be jewelry that's in a, in a lockbox at the bank, right? That you got on your wedding that you've never touched. So an estate includes everything that you own, no matter how small or large, as well as everything that you owe, okay? So we talked about assets and what are known as liabilities or debts, things that you owe to others. Now, from an Islamic perspective, the debts question is really, really important. So we want to ensure that we address uh, this uh, estate uh, plan, that we address both what we own as well as what we owe to others. Now, that said, who then needs an estate plan? Well, everybody, right? Whether you have a lot uh, and, or you have a little. And that goes at whether you're Muslim or not, frankly, right? And we'll talk about the goals but from an Islamic perspective, I want to highlight and emphasize this point. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Whether you have a lot or you have a little bit, you're rich or you're poor, you're old or you're young, as long as you have something or you owe somebody something, you have to plan. Uh, and the famous hadith of the Prophet wasallam is that you shouldn't let two nights pass without having uh, a, a, a plan in place for what's going to happen with the distribution of your wealth. So what are we talking about when we say estate planning? Right? What are the objectives? What are the goals when we're thinking about uh, estate planning? So the first is we want to control our property while we're alive and well. Right? One type of estate plan is I give everything I have away. So if I give everything that I have away, then obviously there's no need to plan. That's not what we're usually trying to do. We want to also think about incapacity. Okay? So most people today with the advancements of uh, modern medicine don't die suddenly, right? There may be a period of incapacity. 
So we want to think about if I'm incapacitated, Allah forbid something happens to me and I'm unable to make healthcare decisions or medical decisions, who do I want to make them, uh, uh, healthcare or financial decisions, who do I want to make those for me, right? So we want to think about uh, designating people and giving them advice and guidance about uh, how to manage my financial affairs, how to distribute my wealth, uh, take care of my family, and of course, what type of guidance should I give someone with respect to end of life care um, and all of the healthcare uh, components? And we'll come back to that, inshallah. So we wanna think about that, right? Often we only think about death and dying, but there may be a, a precursor period of incapacity. Now, the third thing is we wanna give what we have to whom we want the way we want, right? So the assets that we have, we wanna leave them to the people that we want to, right? Our loved ones, the way we want. We don't want the state making those decisions for us. And this is really important. If you don't have an estate plan, the state makes one for you, okay? So this is really important. It's not that, oh, I don't have a plan. No, everybody has a plan. It's just not the plan that you want. It's gonna be the plan that the state imposes upon you. And that's not gonna be consistent with our faith, right? And now as Muslims, this is interesting because when you look through the Quran, you'll see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Aqimu Sala, Atu Zaka, Kutiba Alaikum Siyam, Atimul Hajjah wal Umrah Tarilla. All the commandments that we find in the Quran, they are in generalities. In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to pray, to fast, to give zakah, to go for hajj. He doesn't tell us how in the Quran itself. Right? That we have to go to the Sunnah, we go to the books of hadith, the books of fiqh to find guidance as to how many rak'ahs to pray what assets are zakatable which ones are not uh what do we do when we go for hajj right all those questions are not answered directly in the quran but inheritance is the only obligation that is expressly detailed in in a, in a lot of depth uh in the quran itself and we'll come to those ayat inshallah and then the fourth thing is we want to do it efficiently right we want to make sure that we're not wasting money uh, we're not spending unnecessary taxes get to the government that we can avoid, uh, that we're not paying a bunch of attorney's fees. Nobody wants to do that. Um, and we want to avoid what's known as probate. Okay. So I'll pause on this point about probate. Probate is the process in which the court supervises the transfer of assets. So somebody dies and if, you know, I want to buy their house, well, they're not alive. So how do I go about purchasing their house? Well, one of their relatives has to go to the court, petition the court to supervise the transaction. It's inefficient, it's expensive. Some people describe it as a lawsuit against yourself, okay? Totally unnecessary. Now, I know that we're speaking to an audience of people in different states. Um, most of you are from California, but some of you uh, looks like are from all over the country. Probate is worse in some places than others. So some places might be relatively easier on the spectrum uh, and some places would be much more difficult. Uh, California is one of those where it's inefficient and just like everything in California, it's more expensive. Um, so uh, it's more expensive to live. It's also more expensive to die uh, in the great state of California. I went to law school at Berkeley, so I have a, a great affinity for uh, California and the Bay Area, but these are realities that it's expensive. When I travel around the country, we, um, you know, and I ask communities, how much does it cost to die, to get, have burial costs, all of that, um, you know, we find a big range from, you know, uh, maybe a couple thousand dollars up to $10,000 at different parts of the country. So it's very important to plan for that. Now, which leads me to my next point on what's the overview of Islamic inheritance law. So now we're going to shift from, you know, that's the objective of estate planning. Again, whether you're Muslim or not Muslim, but as Muslims, what's the, uh, what, what happens after a person passes away? So the first thing that happens is funeral and burial expenses. So that needs to be allocated. In most cases, alhamdulillah, our communities are generous and they have you know, um, procedures in place for uh, covering these costs if somebody can't afford them. But nonetheless, it's something that it's useful to have uh, written and documentation about um, where these costs are gonna come from. The second is debts and obligations. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Min ba'di wasiyyatin yusa biha awdain, aw yusi biha awdain, that after the wasiya and the debt. Now, this is really important from an Islamic perspective. Really, really important. The Prophet wouldn't pay, pray janazah 
over the body of a decedent, somebody who passed away, who had debts outstanding. And now we live in a world where, you know, we're, we're swamped or we're, we're drowning in, in debt of all kinds, student loans, consumer loans, credit cards, houses, mortgage, a car, you name it. Um, and so it's very important that we address these debts within our estate plan so that they can be taken care of. And I, maybe I'll come back to this in the Q&A as to kind of separating types of debts uh, between those that are owed to individuals and those that are owed um, you know, to institutions. Then we have what's known as a wasiyah. Okay, so often when we hear the word wasiyah, we think of a will. But the technical definition here of a wasiyah is the discretionary portion that we have of our wealth. And that under sharia, from an Islamic perspective, is up to one third. So you're allowed to give up to one third to anybody that you want uh, or any institution that's not one of your Islamic heirs. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, uh, mashallah, the organizers, Ikna here, this is an opportunity for you to leave a bequest to facilitate the good work that they're doing. This is an opportunity for you to do a sadaqa jariya, a continuous charity, which is one that will benefit a person even after they pass away. And that could be to your local masjid, that could be to your uh, you know, relief organization to build a well, whatever the case may be. Uh, and it's really important that we as Muslims in America uh, today leverage this opportunity to build endowments for our institutions. If we think about the long-term sustainability, if you just look at what COVID uh, did in a few months, how so many of our nonprofits are struggling because they don't have a perpetual revenue generating uh, arm, an endowment that's gonna cover the operating expenses. And so inshallah, uh, we wanna work towards doing that. And this is an incredible opportunity uh, for uh, folks to do so through their wasiyah. Now, uh, the hadith, uh, the famous hadith of the Prophet وسلم, the Sahabi came and asked him, I'd like to give all my wealth in charity. The Prophet وسلم said, no. He said, I want to give half. He said, no. He said, how about a third? And the Prophet وسلم said, uh, a third, uh, kathir, or kama qal, that you can give up to a third and even a third is a lot. So if you have young children, this isn't necessarily advice that we would give. But if you have, you know, if you're an adult, uh, if you're an adult, if your children are adults, then uh, it's probably a really good idea to take advantage of this wasiya to do your own sadaqa jariya. We'll come back to that as well. And then the final component are the fara'id. This area is called ilmul fara'id, the science of predetermined shares, which are the mandatory shares that are laid out in the Quran itself. So the remainder of the estate, if you don't have any debts, or after funeral costs, uh, payment of debts and any wasiya, or if you don't have a wasiya, the rest is going to be non-discretionary. This is all coming directly from the Quran. So I'm going to take a few minutes, inshallah, to highlight some of the uh, verses that are the uh, crux of Islamic inheritance law within the Quran. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse number 11, that Allah Allah fi auladikum, Allah gives you an admonition, a wasiyah regarding your children. He says, that uh, a male child is going to receive two shares while the female child receives one share. Now, this is obviously a point of contention in modern society. Um, and this is one that people say, hey, you know, how can that be? And the the answer, or there's a couple answers. Obviously, we know that the male within the Muslim tradition has financial obligations that they must utilize their inheritance and spend on their closest female relatives, right? So that's going to be the perhaps one of the explanations of why uh, this rule is the way it is. Now, in the absence of that, right, in a society where that doesn't necessarily happen, does the rule drop? The answer is no. The rule still remains because it's coming from a clear verse of the Quran, okay? And we'll come to the end of the verse and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his infinite wisdom uh, explains to us if we're thinking, hey, I got a better scenario or a better solution, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preempts that thought at the end of the uh, ayah. Uh, if there are only female children, they're going to split two thirds. If there's only one, she's going to take half of everything. Now, this part is important that 
uh, Islam really emphasizes the right of parents, right? Uh, Allah ties uh, the not committing shirk and worshiping Allah and immediately thereafter in the Quran mentions being uh, kind and dutiful to one's parents. And that ethic extends post-death, okay? This is contrary to the law in any state in the U.S., as far as I'm aware, that if a person is married, has children, no jurisdiction is going to provide automatically shares to their parents. But Islamic law does. So if there are children, parents are going to receive one-sixth each of your wealth. If no children, mother, right? Today's Mother's Day. Uh, the mother is going to receive one third. And if there are no children, but two or more siblings, then the mother's share is going to drop back down to one sixth, right? And you can see the complexity, subhanAllah, uh, as an attorney, uh, this reads like a, a, a statute, a code book. It's over 1400 years old. It's withstood the test of time and is still equally applicable to our society today, subhanAllah. I mean, it's amazing if you look at the depth of these verses. Uh, and this is after the wasiya and the debts have been paid. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, you know what? If it were up to you and up to me, we wouldn't know how to make these distributions. Assume for a moment you have an elderly father and you have a young son, right? The son is two-year-old, the father is 80 years old. Which one deserves more of your wealth, right? If I had to make that call, which one deserves more of my wealth, right? I could make arguments both ways. The child has his whole life in front of him. The father I owe everything to because he took care of me, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, You have no idea. You don't know which one will bring you more benefit. These are mandatory shares from Allah. In Allah kana aliman hakima. Allah is most knowledgeable and most wise, right? All knowing, all wise. Right? Just in case you think, well, you know, this is, this is interesting. My family situation is unique, however, and so it should be some other sort of rule. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Inna Allah kana aliman hakima. The next ayah, uh, should be 12. I need to update this. Um, ayah 12 in Surah An-Nisa. وَلَكُمْ نِصْفُ مَا تَرَكَ أَزْوَاجُكُمْ إِلَّمْ يَكُلْ لَهُنَّ وَلَدٍ uh, فَإِن كَانَ لَهُنَّ وَلَدٌ فَلَكُمُ الرُّبُعُ مِمَّا تَرَكُمْ Now this is talking about spouses. If a married woman uh, passes away without children, uh, the widower, the, the surviving husband is going to receive one half of her estate. And if she had children, he's going to receive a one fourth, again, after the wasiyah and debts. Now for the spouse, for the uh, widow, If a widow, uh, if a man dies, the wife is going to receive, the widow is going to receive a fourth if he didn't have children or an eighth if he did have children. Okay, now notice again, it's a two to one ratio here of what the female inherits compared to the male. And we'll come back to how does this apply in modern context and modern society uh, at the end, but the rules need to be very clearly understood. Uh, again, after we'll see ya, and debts are paid. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so we said in general, males and females are gonna receive twice, uh, males are gonna receive twice as much as similarly situated females. Uh, given the financial obligations that the males hold. Then Allah talks about a kalala. There's an exception to that rule here uh, for maternal siblings uh, who are going to inherit equally. It's getting a little bit technical, so we're going to gloss over this part. But just note that this is part of the rules from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, uh, these are, this is a wasiyah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahu alimun halim. Again, Allah highlights his knowledge and his forbearance. That he has given us these rules out of mercy for us as a, an opportunity for us to follow a system. And when everybody adheres to that system, it maintains a level of family and societal harmony. Every one of us knows people, has seen within our families disputes about inheritance after someone passes away. There's no way you can say, oh, I've never seen that before, or I've never heard of that before, 
right? And so if we follow these objective rules from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you kind of throw your hands up and say, look, these are the rules that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordained in the Quran. I'm not making, you know, favoring any one over the other, but rather this is uh, divinely ordained from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All right, so let's take a quick, exa a quick example. Uh, we've got Ahmed and Sara. They're a married couple. They've got three children and Sara has her mother Aisha. So Sara uh, unfortunately passes away in a tragic accident. And now the question becomes who gets what, right? So from an Islamic perspective, usually when we do this, there's a lot more, you know, we're doing it in a, in a live setting. Um, so it's a lot more interactive. But, you know, if you want to try this out based on the, the rules that we just covered, um, if we start with the mother's share, she should get one sixth and Ahmed should get one fourth. And then the children are going to get the remainder at a two to one ratio of right? So that's what the theme would be under Islamic law. Now there's a really important question here. Well, let's talk about state law. So now again, with people being in different states, let's assume we're talking about a community property jurisdiction like California. Ahmed would get 100% of her community property in the absence of a, a well-drafted estate plan. So this is really, really important. Now, uh, this is a good opportunity to pause and talk about how we own stuff as, uh, some, uh, as a married couple, right? For those of you that are married, uh, how do you own your assets? Most people own assets jointly, right? Husband and wife on the title of the property on the house, for example, or on a bank account, uh, on an investment account. Um, and so it's important to realize that in those cases, the most of the time, the assets are going to pass 100% to the surviving spouse, right? And that's not necessarily consistent or not necessarily, it's, that's not consistent with Islamic law, okay? So because remember, the mother, the children, they all get shares. Now, if everything goes to Ahmed, right? If everything ends up going to Ahmed, now I should also mention community property very briefly, is a form of property ownership in about half of this, or not half, in the Western part of the United States in which everything is deemed 50-50. Uh, in the event, you know, Ahmed or Sada earned $100, it's gonna be deemed 50% to Ahmed and 50% to Sada in the case of a divorce or in the case of death. All right, so now answering this question is really important as to who owns what. In order to implement these fractions, it's impossible to do so. And I know this was some of the questions in the Q&A. How do we determine one sixth of what, one fourth of what, what, you know, all these fractions of what, if we haven't clarified that? And that's precisely the reason that we need to create a plan. Now, somebody might say, well, Ahmed's a nice guy. Look, he's got a kufi, he's got a beard. Uh, it, it's all fine. If he gets everything, he can just distribute it and do the taqseem and everything will be fine. Um, and so most people are comfortable with that idea that, you know what, if, if everything goes to my spouse, it's all good. They'll take care of it. And yes, most of the time that's true. That is true. It could happen, but that's more of a hope than a plan. Okay. Why? Because if we look at a few years later, maybe a few months, Ahmed, the poor guy, he's lonely. What happens? He meets Hajar and he remarries, right? Now what happens? He's got two new kids who ironically look exactly like him. Uh, uh, so they are now remarried and he doesn't still make a will or a trust or an estate plan. And so what happens a few years later when Ahmed passes away now, right? On Ahmed's death, depending on the state, now this isn't going to be universal, but depending upon the state law, Hajj is going to get all of their community property now and a third of the separate property. Again, I know I'm getting technical, but every state is a little bit different, but understand that she's gonna get a lot of his wealth, which he got from her, right? Which maybe not even have been his in the first place. And uh, his children are gonna get something uh, on Hajar's death. Hajar's death's money is gonna go to her kids. It's not gonna go to his kids. Um, and who gets nothing in this scenario? Remember, Sada's mother, Aisha, she got nothing. So if we rely on the in-law relationship uh, and hope that they give the shares to the parents, you know, there's a good chance that might not happen. So this is just kind of a, this is not intended to make you an expert in Islamic inheritance law, 
rather just to give you a flavor of how nuanced the rules are and how important it is for us to have a plan in place if we intend for our uh, assets to be distributed according to our religious obligations, which hope, hopefully we've now emphasized how important that is. So let's move then from a theory of Islamic law to where do we start? And what are the documents that I need to have, right? What are the actual, what's the step-by-step -step process? So the first thing is known as a last will, okay? Everybody's heard of a will. I need to make a will. We get these calls all the time. I got to make a will. Why? I don't know. I just, I, I, sounds like something that we should do and we put it off for a while, right? So a will is really important. Everybody should have a will. And I'll talk in the next slide about what is a will. Power of attorney. So uh, this is a document that governs what happens if you're incapacitated, who's going to make your financial decisions. Notice uh, or, or understand that a will only kicks in post-death. A power of attorney kicks in if you are incapacitated and you need somebody to go to the bank, you need someone to handle your finances, your taxes, all of that stuff, then it's important that you have someone de designated so they don't have to go to court to apply to be your financial agent. Advanced healthcare directive, really important. Uh, in light of COVID, I mean, this highlights for us our own mortality, whether you're young, whether you're old, whether you're working in a hospital or you're working, you know, at a grocery store or you're working from home, anybody at any time can get sick. And we should have clear guidelines about who's going to make healthcare decisions for me in the event of in incapacity. And I want who can make those objectively without, you know, really emotional conditions. And what are the Islamic guidelines with respect to end of life care, with respect to organ donations, with respect to, um, uh, you know, pulling the plug, uh, DNRs, all these questions, right? We want to designate agents and we want to provide guidance to them so that they know how to make those decisions. And too often what you hear about are disputes and what you see are disputes where people are supposed to be reading Quran, supposed to be making dua, and instead there's family fights um, about what decisions should be made. So advanced healthcare directives, these have different names in different states, healthcare proxy, uh, healthcare power of attorney, uh, different names, but essentially living will, um, all of the same uh, objectives. And then in most cases, a trust, okay? So what is a trust? Why is it better? That's what we're gonna talk about for the next few minutes, inshallah. So let's go back to what is a will? Why do I need a will, okay? The pros and cons of a will. Anybody who has children, Anybody who has minor children, you must make a will because la samahallah, Allah forbid, right? Something happens to you and your spouse or the parent, both parents of the child or the children, you don't want the state to take custody. So if nothing else, right? Obviously we talked a lot about finances and about inheritance, uh, but if nothing else, you at least want to guarantee that you pick people you trust to be guardians of your children and to raise them in a way that is consistent with the way you're trying to raise your children, right? So very, very important. Everybody should have a will. A name, a personal representative for your estate. So somebody who's going to be responsible for managing, liquidating, distributing your assets. And it governs who gets separate probate assets. Really important. Uh, it only covers assets that are not going to be jointly titled. Right, that don't have a beneficiary designation. I'm going to re-emphasize that point again and again in the next few minutes. So cons, maybe limitations might have been a better way to think about this. Wills do have to go through probate. So if you have a will, you say, this is what I want to happen to my wealth. This is who's in charge. It still has to go through the court process. Okay. So for anybody who's trying to avoid the probate process, uh, which is most of us, um, a will is better than nothing but probably not the best solution, okay? Now, it doesn't control any jointly owned assets or assets with beneficiary designations. Your 401k, your uh, retirement accounts, if somebody happens to have life insurance, uh, if somebody has a beneficiary already named on their bank accounts, all that stuff is gonna trump your will, right? So you make this really nice Islamic will and in your uh, 401k beneficiary designation, you've got your, you know, ex- uh, spouse still named there, right? There's a good chance that person's going to get the money. It's going to be a disaster, right? Or you name one child or you name a spouse on the beneficiary designation and your will says something completely different, consistent with Sharia, the one person's going to get everything. Now they have this ethical obligation to distribute it, which they may or may not do. So really important limitation here. Uh, and you can't do much tax planning uh, 
you know, it's a simple solution. Um, how much does it cost? Where do I do this? How do I start? I know that was some of the questions. Typically, if you go to an attorney, you're probably going to spend around $500, maybe $1,000, somewhere in that range. You can do it yourself for free online. There's a lot of now uh, self-help options uh, for creating a will. And uh, alhamdulillah, one of the things that I'm really uh, happy that we were able to do is uh, we were able to develop a free will tool for every Muslim in the U.S. Okay, so you can go to www.muslim.estate. You can create a will. It's going to calculate for you who your heirs are per the Sharia. You can input your debts. You can put input your wasiya, and it'll print out a document. You can go and get that executed, meaning you need to have two witnesses and hopefully get it notarized, depending upon what your state law uh, rules are. Um, it's a free basic tool that works in basic cases for everyone. Think of it like the TurboTax, right? Uh, if you have a simple case, it works. The more wealth you have, the more you likely you are to go to a CPA to get a customly drafted, you know, to do your taxes custom. Similarly, in this case, um, the more complex your assets, the more complex your family, uh, the more you need to seek out the services of an estate planning attorney uh, who can help, but it's better than nothing. And so if you have nothing and you are probably not going to do anything, at least start here. And then, you know, hopefully uh, go back and, you know, in our office, we call the essentials packet, which is essential to everyone, is a will, a power of attorney, and a healthcare directive, right? That's essential for everyone. The better solution in most cases is a living trust, okay? A living trust. So a living trust is a, also known as a revocable trust or a family trust. Um, this is going to be a better solution for most people that have accumulated some amount of wealth. Now, most people, when they think of trust, they think of, you know, billionaires or like hiding money or something that only the ultra wealthy or the ultra really old people do. This is not the case anymore, right? Living trust can be done by just about anybody. Um, and it's a very effective tool for owning, managing, and, you know, transferring wealth. Okay. So how does it work? You create a trust, it's like an invisible wrapper that we put around your assets. Or another way to think about it is it's a bucket and you add all your assets inside of that bucket. You transfer assets while you're alive into the trust and you maintain control. So you're still in charge. You can still buy, you can still sell, you can add, you can subtract, you can cancel the whole thing if you want. Um, this could be a separate trust for each spouse or it could be a joint trust uh, in which we put assets that belong to both married uh, husband and wife into that trust. Now, the trust never dies. This is really, really key. So because the trust never dies, the assets never have to go to probate. So we can completely bypass, eliminate the court process that otherwise would have to be implemented upon the death of either the first spouse or the second spouse. In this case, in both cases, uh, we're not going to have to go through uh, probate. And we can distribute assets according to the Sharia. Why do I say you can do that better in a trust than a will? Uh, for this reason, that question of what, you know, who owns my house? Who owns my bank accounts, right? We've got two names on them. Uh, who owns them? Is it clear, right? You get to clarify uh, inside of a trust and often uh, along with the trust, you're gonna have a property agreement uh, or a transmutation agreement, uh, marital property agreement, again, different terms to really clarify who owns what. Because if I want to distribute my wealth for the Sharia, I need to ensure that um, it's very clear between, uh, in the case of married couples, I keep emphasizing this point, uh, not just married couples, but also if, you know, uh, sometimes parents have children's names on assets or they'll add a kid to the bank account or have property in one child's name. You know, it's very important. Are those just uh, names or are they actually ownership? This is where all disputes arise post-death. Um, so the trust is going to allow for, uh, you know, probate avoidance. Another problem with probate is we don't want to have a judge reading, you know, uh, something according to Sharia, right? We just don't want to do that. We don't want an environment where, you know, we have to leave our personal uh, decisions uh, up to whether a judge thinks they're reasonable or not. Right? We want to do them the way we want, again, as Muslims uh, living in the country. And the beauty is, uh, you know, a lot of times people ask, you know, uh, is Islamic inheritance applicable in the U.S.? Uh, would, the, would, would they respect it or do we just go with the law of the land? The beauty of the law of the land is that you can do whatever you want 
as long as you follow the procedures and as long as you have uh, the appropriate legally executed documents, the law allows you to defer to whatever you want to do. Uh, but in the absence of a plan, the state is going to impose its rules upon you. It's also valid in every state. So if you have property in California and Arizona and in Texas and in Florida, uh, and you don't have a will, uh, or even if you have a will, you're potentially going to have to have a probate in each of those states. So you can imagine the cost just exponentially multiplying, very expensive, very inefficient. You could, your trust can own all of those assets in different states, or you can have LLCs that are also owned by your trust. Now, how much does it cost? Typically, I'm giving you ballpark ranges. Uh, you go to an attorney, you're probably going to look at spending between two to $5,000 to set up a trust. Um, more assets you have, the more complicated it is, the more complex a family is, the higher the fee. Um, uh, but usually, uh, this is going to be the starting fee. Uh, you might find a range a little bit lower, a little bit higher, um, depending upon who you ask. Um, anything much lower than this, I would worry about. Anything much higher than this, I would worry about as well, right? Just so you understand. Um, and uh, I will also mention people ask about, you know, are there annual fees? This is not uh, something that's registered with your state. So there is no annual fee like an LLC or a corporation. Um, and most attorneys don't charge annual fees. Um, as well. Um, in some cases, some people do, but most of the time these are startup costs. And then you update this document when you have major life changes. So what we tell clients is every three years, you should probably update this. Or when somebody's born, somebody dies, you have a major change in your job, like your company IPOs or, you know, really big major life events is when you want to update this thing. Smaller stuff you can update on your own, uh, you know, adding and subtracting assets and things like that. You don't have to work with an attorney every time you do this. In addition, and we're about to wrap up and then we'll take Q&A. Um, most businesses in the US are family owned, right? We see this now again with light of COVID, how many family businesses are struggling? Um, very few businesses survive to the next generation when the founder passes away. So the trust allows for business succession so that we don't have to go to probate. Also think about often within family businesses, maybe one child is involved, the others are not. Right? So how do we account for that? It's not fair if everybody inherits equally and one child is doing all of the work and has helped grow the business. Um, but maybe that child never got their name put on the ownership. So you want to think about how do we ensure that everything is fair uh, and how do we ensure that this business can continue to provide income for my family in the event I were to pass away. And, and I guess one more point I'll just make here is, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kullu nafsin mawt. We're not talking about hypothetical if I pass away right? Uh, often this is like a, a touchy subject in some cultures. It's like, don't talk about death or you're going to die, right? The reality is we're all going to die. It's just a question of when. And so the Prophet ﷺ, he says, لا عقل كالتدبير. There's no intelligence, like sound planning, like good planning. And we plan for everything in our life, but we tend to forget about the one inevitable reality. Uh, you know, the famous quote that there's only two certainties in life, death and taxes. Um, well, taxes may or may not, you might be able to avoid taxes, but you can't avoid death. So we want to prepare, right? We want to take the steps that are necessary to prepare in advance. Charitable planning. Uh, we talked about the wasiya. I mean, if a person is, you know, Allah bless them with wealth and our community is blessed with tremendous wealth, particularly so many immigrants that came to this country with very, very little and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed them with so much, right? Utilize the wasiya. Take advantage of this. Do your own sadaqah jariya. Right, so this is something that can be incorporated into an estate plan. In addition, if you have unpaid zakat, you have haven't gone for hajj, you miss salah. Right, there are things that you can stipulate and articulate in your estate plan. Say, I want someone to go for hajj on my behalf. If I die before I go for hajj, right? Uh, so somebody had the intention to go this year, for example, and the circumstances are such that we're not able to go. You know, write it in your estate plan. So that if I pass away, it's clear that somebody takes 10,000 or 12,000 or whatever the amount is and performs hajj on my behalf. Um, and the last thing about trusts is there's different kinds of trusts. Some of you may have heard of asset protection trusts. Um, and this is a tool that uh, you can protect your assets from potential lawsuits. So in the event um, you know, you're a physician and somebody is trying to sue you, or you know, there's a car accident or a tenant, whatever the case may be, we ask Allah for his afiyah, for his protection, but you can proactively plan. This is not illegal. This is actually taking advantage of all of the legal tools that are available to uh, protect our assets. And so again, some states, this is more important than others. 
And these types of trusts are a little bit more advanced. They're often set up in uh, different states, not the ones you live in um, for asset protection purposes. So that's an overview of the universe of estate planning, right? We started off with, um, we started off with this idea of uh, what our, what is estate planning, right? That everybody needs to be thinking about what happens when I'm no longer able to act myself in the event of incapacity and once I pass away? What happens to my loved ones, right? From a perspective of guardianship and what happens to my wealth from the perspective of how is it transferred? And how is it transferred? We wanna make sure that it's transferred efficiently. We wanna make sure it's transferred uh, quickly uh, and it's done in a Sharia -a compliant manner because this is one of the most clear obligations in the Quran. And in fact, if you look at ayah number 13 through I believe 15 of Surah Nisa, there are very, very strong punishments that follow when Allah says somebody who violates the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately after the verses of inheritance, right? So it's really important. These are not just advices and, and, uh, that we should think about, but rather we really want to implement them. Uh, and then we talked about how to go about doing it. What are the tools that you can utilize? Uh, a will, a power of attorney, a healthcare directive, and a trust. The will is something that um, you can do a basic version of for free. My goal and my hope is that everybody watching at least goes to the website, which is www.muslim.estate, E-S-T-A-T-E, -E, and uh, you uh, create at least a free will, right? And we said inside of that will, articulate who you owe money to and what your debts are and what your wasiya wishes are, even if it's a small token gift, right? You know, you want to think about uh, ikna, you want to think about uh, your local masjid, you want to think about the future uh, and how you can be part of a legacy and leave a legacy behind of, you know, strong institutions here in the U.S. And then lastly, the custom components, the trust or the custom will, um, that's where you want to reach out to an attorney for. We're happy to help. Uh, if you want to reach out, this is the firm information uh, for my firm. Uh, we can help. Uh, like I said, I know we have folks from around the country. When we work with folks in different states, we work with local attorneys to help transfer your assets. So if you want to reach out, we're happy to assist you. Um, our fees are usually within the ranges that I described. If you have a local attorney or you already have a plan, please go ahead. Just make sure to do it, right? This is the key objective. Uh, work to, you know, when you're motivated to do this, this is one of those things that's probably been on people's back burners for a long time. But take advantage of the opportunity now in the reminder. To, um, to go ahead and implement your plan, inshallah. Jazakumullahu khairan. And I guess uh, we'll switch over to Q&A now. So Brother Waqas, um, let's see, how do we, okay. have any new questions please email us uh, uh, ca at iknacsj.org and in the meanwhile uh, i think you're being provided uh, with the answer to the questions that we have already received i see oh wow <laughs> yeah. so we've got 143 questions um mashallah um people are really interested in the topic all right so do we want to What's the best way to do this? Should we just try to run through some of them? Do you want to ask them or do you, do you want to pick the ones that are important? How do you want to go about doing this? Or Mustafa? We can start with the ones uh, that were uh, sent at the time of registration, I guess, uh, the, yeah. the early ones that, that have been shared. Okay. So, um, so I, I, as, a, as a disclaimer here, I'm not going to get through all these questions. Um, just so, so, so we know we're fasting. Um, the idea, remember, what was the objective of this webinar? This is really important is to come back to the point here. The point is to plant a seed to help you understand this is really, really important as Muslims in this country, uh, individually for your family, as well as for our institutions, right? That's my primary objective is to get you to realize that point. Now, some of these questions I will answer uh, or to attempt to answer. Uh, that have general applicability. But some of these questions are specific to your situation. And those are ones that you'll want to seek out counsel 
and have you know individual consultations for. Um, so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, just try, inshallah. So Bismillah. Um, I saw this question come up a few times about uh, do parents overseas inherit, right? I'm rephrasing some of your questions as well. So uh, do parents overseas inherit? The answer to that question is yes. Um, if uh, a person has relatives overseas and they're entitled to that one sixth share, they're still going to inherit. Now, this may lead to another um, question of what does it mean to inherit, right? Does it mean I have to sell everything I own immediately and cut everything up into pieces? And then, uh, and then that's what, uh, what, you know, immediately distribute? Not necessarily, right? Um, people, if you want to think about it, you want to analogize it to kind of vested shares. Um, a person passes away, their shares vest. So if the assets are not distributed right away, then eventually when they are sold, that person is going to inherit a portion or a share. And if they pass away in the interim, then uh, their beneficiaries are going to inherit. Um, so the shares vest and they don't go away. If somebody's alive at the time of death, they're going to be entitled to a share. Uh, just to understand from an Islamic perspective, not every asset needs to get cut up. Uh, but if a uh, parent is entitled to one sixth, for example, and there's enough cash, they can be paid off and the house can be kept. So it's a really situational thing. Um, and if one heir demands a share, and everybody's adults, for example, then you know the Sharia would uh, would the, the 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 goal should be to give that beneficiary their share, right? Uh, but if everybody's willing to have an agreement, say for example, I want to leave everything to our parents, let my mom continue to live in the house, we don't need anything, that's totally fine as well. The the heirs can come to a agreement post death. Um, this next question looks complicated. I'm going to put that one aside. Uh, how to navigate the differences between Quranic and California law. I think that was the goal of hopefully uh, we answered that question, inshallah, is uh, California law is a default law. California law is going to allow you to follow the Quranic rules if you take the appropriate legal steps to uh, create a plan that is consistent with your faith. The state respects it. Um, Okay, there's a question about who gets my wealth, right? So uh, I would suggest going to the Muslim.estate website uh, using the tool. It'll calculate for you who your heirs are. So you're going to put in my parents, my children, my spouse, my, and it's going to go more and more distant if you don't have those people um, who are going to inherit. Usually the universe is going to be parents, children, spouse, right? But in the absence of some of those people, then siblings will inherit. In the absence of that, then uh, it might go more and more distant. Um, can I distribute my assets equally, right? So that is uh, the question we get all the time. Uh, and I think it should be apparent from the Quranic ayat that the Quran calls on a distribution of a two to one ratio of boys to girls. And that's not because boys are better. That's because that's what the Quran says. And Allah said, in Allah kana alimun hakima. Now, while you're alive, you can gift whatever you want to whomever you want. So if you're alive, you want to gift to your children equally, wonderful. You want to gift more to your daughters, Right? And the intention is not to do lul, right? You can't do this with an intention to deprive others or to commit lul. But if the intention is I want to make sure my daughters are, you know, well off, financially independent and not, you know, reliant on anybody else, gift while you're alive. Hiba is what's known as gifting while you're alive. Uh, so do that. Uh, post death, the only way to change the rules is if everybody agrees. Okay? So if everybody is adults and everybody agrees and says, you know what, we're fine. Uh, then that's fine. Uh, that's, those disclaimers are valid, but they need to be made uh, voluntarily without coercion. What we find often overseas is that, uh, you know, somebody will force uh, the girls to sign a paper that says, you know, I give up my share and it's under duress, it's under coercion, and that's not appropriate. Um, and so that's the way to do that. Uh, questions about how to create your state plan? Like I said, um, uh, you can reach out, uh, you can use the free will, you can reach out to my office, you can reach out to any other attorney uh, that you know that does this type of work. Um, is it better to transfer your second and third property to kids? Um, it depends. Uh, depends on your situation and depends on uh, what the objectives are.
you know, uh, one of the things I'm really impressed with is the amount of questions that we have and, and uh, how interested people are in fulfilling this obligation, right? Uh, and I think, like I said earlier, I think uh, COVID-19 really hit home in this point for each and every one of us that we should have these in place because we never know uh, when our time is coming. Uh, and so hopefully you have now at least enough basic resources to get started um, uh, in this area. Remedies, if the daughter sole breadwinner to support parents or family and her brother did not help and her parents pass away, she's still given half the inheritance. Yeah, so this is that situation we talked about. Um, often we get this question, you know, I want my wife to get more than an eighth. So, okay, brother, no problem. Why don't you gift to her? Well, I don't love her that much, you know? Um, so Hiba is allowed. You can gift while you're alive. You can gift to your children. You can gift to your spouse. Um, and that's going to be the mechanism here. Um, that's the way that uh, we want to do it. And you want to train your children as well, right? You want to, from a young age, in, you know, instill upon them the values that say, look, your responsibility to your male children is to take care of your sisters, is to be responsible for them, is to, uh, you know, uh, be be there for them and be there financially as well as uh, in other ways as well. Um, this is a good question. So what about people who are not Muslim? Uh, if you don't have Muslim relatives, uh, then the rules are not gonna apply, right? So if you have Muslim relatives, that person might be entitled to a share potentially, uh, uh, the whole share potentially depends on the situation, depends on the opinion of the scholars. Um, otherwise, uh, the ulama give the opinion that you can and this is one you should consult your scholar, your local uh, Islamic imam and scholar uh, on to get the opinion that you trust. Um, but you should have the one option is that you should have the ability to give to charity if you have no Muslim relatives. Um, is life insurance Islamic? Um, so uh, this is a big question, a conversation of debate uh, among uh, scholars. Uh, classically, insurance of all kinds is considered impermissible. And then there are exceptions made for need in what's legally uh, deemed mandatory, like health insurance or car insurance. Um, and then life insurance has different opinions. Uh, most scholars say it's not permissible. There's different kinds of life insurance. And so then you can get into more and more nuance uh, about what may be permissible. Uh, although I will say that the life insurance that your insurer, I mean, your employer provides for you if you're an employee that you don't pay for, uh, most of the scholars, if not all, will deem that to be permissible as a gift. Um, that's not something you pay for, and that's not something that you get money back if you decline. Um, another good good question are is inheritance, can you condition inheritance on poor life choices? Um, so let's say you don't get along with your kid. Uh, can you cut them out? And the answer is absolutely not. Um, doesn't matter how non-religious they are, how a poor of a relationship you have with your child, as long as they are Muslim, this is the key, as long as they are Muslim, and we're going to assume they're Muslim unless they've actively said they're not, uh, even if they don't pray, even if they're not religious, uh, you're going to assume they're Muslim, and they're going to still inherit from you. And remember, you want people to make dua for you, right, after you pass away. So imagine you leave someone an in inheritance, and they weren't even expecting it. Inshallah, they make dua. And this is one of the other points here, is I understand the desire to change the rule and say I, my situation is different and this and that. But remember, this is the last thing you do in your life and you want reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, we want to follow the, the rules. Um, that said, well, another way to look at this question is if I pass away and my child is 18 years old, uh, I don't want them to get a bunch of money because they might spoil, they might you know, squander the wealth, they might make bad life choices, they might not be mature. Um, so from that perspective, a trust is great because we can set some more rules and kind of have age-based distributions, again, within the parameters of what's acceptable within the sharia and the definition of rushd uh, or intellectual maturity that's mentioned in Surah An-Nisa as well. Um, how would the shares be divided? Yeah, that question we're going to leave. You can um, do that one uh, through there. some online calculators. Uh, or consult with uh, Mufti. If it's cash value, life insurance, only the purpose of tax-free growth is legal in Islam or not. So we talked about that a little bit. That's a question I'm going to say. Um, you can consult with uh, an alim uh, that you trust. There are differing opinions. Um, uh, again, the, the majority of which and the conservative opinion uh, of which is going to be no. 
um, during making a will, what if you have no Muslim relatives? Same question, right? So if you're a convert, you have no Muslim relatives, you can, um, you can leave to other relatives, you can leave to charity. Um, fee for comprehensive estate planning, we talked about that. So your rough range is probably gonna be between two to 5K. If you own a business, you've got a partnership, you've got a bunch of land, you've got all A, B, C, D, E, F, G, it'll probably be higher. Um, and if you're talking about just a married couple, family with some kids, basic assets, that's probably gonna be the comprehensive uh, plan. Um, and the template, the free one is totally available for everybody, muslim.estate. Uh, do items in safety box and bank go into probate if it is in both spouses' name? Uh, this question somehow got added to the top of the, the thing, Mustafa. Uh, <laughs> so yes, uh, if this is a big one. Um, if you don't have a trust that owns that box or you don't have a beneficiary named on that account, then maybe on the first spouse's death, it'll go automatically to the second. But on the second spouse's death, now you're stuck with a box with a bunch of stuff inside. And uh, the only way for that uh, box to be accessed is through the court appointing a personal representative um, or a executor. And so that's gonna have to be a, uh, something that happens through the probate um, process. A lot of people here, mashallah, are asking about not having Muslim uh, relatives. And I think maybe that's something that we we'll want to have more depth on. Uh, if you are a convert and you don't have Muslim relatives, um, you know, the, the idea of the rules is you don't want to, you don't want to uh, do dhulm on any person's right. So the Islamic right here is going to be to the, um, the uh, there are no, you know, going to be no Islamic rights uh, that are going to be vested in any non-Muslim heirs. Um, now, if a person has some non-Muslim heirs, this is maybe a corollary to that question. If a person has some non-Muslim relatives they want to leave wealth to, they could do so through the wasiya, right? But they wouldn't inherit by right. A lot of questions about life insurance. Um, a lot of questions about not uh, or, or disinheriting a relative, uh, as we said, should not happen uh, unless the person is not Muslim, not if they're not practicing. Uh, property overseas, that's a good thing to talk about. Property overseas is not covered by the uh, estate plan that you create in the US, okay? So uh, if you have a will, you have a trust, whatever you have, it's not gonna be covered. You're gonna have to have a separate plan for over there. Now, again, from an Islamic perspective, it's important to think about the comprehensive whole. You've got a lot of assets overseas. Well, when we talk about fraction distribution, we wanna make sure that it is uh, covered. What assets require a will? Right, so uh, if a person has a small amount of assets, every state has what's known as a probate exemption uh, or small estate, I don't know about every state, but most states have what's known as a small estate affidavit or exemption to probate. And that could be, um, you know, if you have, and the numbers vary, maybe it's 70,000 or 100,000 or something like that. If your net estate is less than that, then you could do an administration without probate. Um, now, of course, uh, anything that has a beneficiary designation is gonna go without probate. So any beneficiary designation will pass automatically without probate and any joint tenancy with right of survivorship will go without probate, at least on the first spouse's death. Then on the second spouse's death, it would likely have to go through probate. Uh, stepchildren, that's good. Stepchildren, adopted children, they don't inherit uh, from the decedent by right, they can inherit via wasiya. okay? So up to that one third, if you have an adopted child, you have a stepchild you wanna support, you can do so through the one third, but Islamic inheritance law preferences biological relationships, this is important, this is just the way it works. Um, that's why the spouse's share is lower compared to uh, the blood relatives, the lineal and uh, the descendants uh, and ascendants. Um, Mm. Well, this is good too. What happens if you're divorced Islamically but still married by the state? Uh, 
what happens? You're gonna have a problem. <laughs> so uh, we get this from time to time. Uh, anytime the 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 Islamic um, definition doesn't match the state definition, you have a, a potential for challenge. Uh, so understand this point. Uh, if you are married via Islam, your Islamic spouse is entitled to inherit. So if a person has two uh, Islamic uh, wives, they're both entitled to inherit. Obviously, that's not going to be the case under state law. Um, and anytime you have this type of conflict, you're just setting up conflict, right? So there's a good chance there's going to be a problem. If somebody divorces Islamically, but doesn't go through the process of divorcing through the state, now Islamically that, you know, divorced spouse is not entitled to the inheritance, but from state law perspective, they are, and they could challenge. Um, the other reason I don't think I, I touched on this earlier is um, you, we were focused a little bit on California and uh, tech community property jurisdictions like Arizona and Texas. Um, but in other states, one of uh, we have what's known as elective shares. And in those states, you know, the surviving spouse is entitled to a statutory share of the estate uh, by the state law. It doesn't mean they have to, but they are allowed to take a share. In almost every case, it's going to exceed the one eighth that a wife is entitled to, a widow is entitled to under the Sharia. So a couple points worth mentioning here are that it's very important for, in the case of married couples, uh, both spouses to be on the same page when you do this type of planning, right? This is not a, I'm making a plan and I'm not talking to my wife or I'm not talking to my husband. Both spouses should be on the same page. Um, and then uh, again, this is part of the reasons why we recommend trust because we wanna do things outside of the probate uh, process altogether. Uh, another good question is if you spent a lot of money on um, one child and not the other, does that get taken into consideration? Um, not really. Uh, it can get taken into consideration post administration once you pass away. But uh, if you paid private school for one kid and public school for the other kid, um, it's still gonna be, uh, uh, the shares are still the shares per the, per the share. Um, when do we recommend creating a trust? If, if you need like a, 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 a black letter law, like a, what's the number? We say a few hundred thousand dollars of net worth, right? The more you have, the better it is to create a trust. Um, and it depends again, where you live, how important it is to create a trust or not. But um, in most cases, it's better. It's just a question of, is it worth the startup cost um, uh, and the fees to set this up? Uh, more questions about, you know, child making bad decisions. Can we take them out um, of the estate plan? And the answer is no, as long as they're Muslim. Um, there's some questions about how do you make a will uh, legal? Um, so we talked about that. Uh, every state has different rules. You should review the rules for your state. In general, you need to have two witnesses. Uh, it's better to have witnesses that are not related to you. And then it's better to have it notarized. Um, so if you wanna take all of the right steps, in most cases, you'll wanna have two people that are not related to you and then have, those have that document notarized while all of those people are together. Now this gets complicated in light of COVID and stay at home orders and shelter in place. Some states started doing online signings. Um, but most states or the, 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 the classic law on this is that it has to be wet signatures and everybody has to be in the same room. Um, but now there are there is a move in some cases to online signing. So you'll wanna check with your state. If you have a trust, do you still need a will? Yes, right? Your will is going to govern the guardianship of children and it's going to be the place that says whatever I own should go to my trust upon my death. Who should have a copy? That's a good question. Um, we recommend uh, giving a copy to the people that you name, right? So that they can utilize it when needed. Uh, 
Um, so I don't know if these were uh, which ones were original and which ones are not. Uh, hopefully, the distinction between the will and trust and who needs a will and who needs a trust uh, is a little bit more clear now. Um, the more you have, the more likely you are to need a trust. Uh, um, if your house is paid off, for example, uh, probably it's best to keep it in a trust. Uh, if you have a few hundred thousand dollars of net worth, um, you have some sizable retirement accounts. Remember, if you have retirement accounts and you just name your children directly on there or your family or you calculate the shares and you put them in there, then that means when the kids turn 18, they're going to get all that wealth. And that might be a bad result as well. From a, It might be right from an Islamic perspective, but it might be wrong from a practice perspective because then maybe they're not going to work as hard. They won't uh, have a good work ethic or they'll squander their wealth. Um, and also if someone predeceases, one of the other beauties of the trust is that it has a built-in recalculation mechanism because we never know who's going to die first. Um, so if we say, you know, my, these people inherit X, Y, Z, it turns out they're not the people who are alive, then we have a problem again. Um, uh, funeral arrangements, burial plans, should they be included? Yeah, I think so. Uh, most of the time this does work, um, work itself out when you have a Muslim family and a Muslim community. But in any case where a person, particularly if a person is a convert, they have non-Muslim family members who might try to impose uh, non-Muslim funeral arrangements or burial arrangements, uh, you should definitely, definitely memorialize those wishes. Um, uh, another good question is, what about if you already have a trust, it's not Islamic, what do you do then? Well, you update it, you restate it. Um, it's called a restatement uh, and Islamicize it, make it Sharia compliant, you know. Uh, a lot of questions about cost, I think, uh, and how to go about, how do you find an attorney? Um, you know, I think we laid that part out. Uh, our fees in our office are going to range in the, in the fee range that we laid out uh, as well. We also take uh, MetLife and uh, Hyatt, uh, no, MetLife and ARAG. So Hyatt and MetLife are the same and ARAG legal plan. So that can offset a portion of your costs if you happen to have those plans. Um, Otherwise, you can work with any attorney. There was another question about, uh, can I work with any other attorney? You can work with any attorney as long as you're able to articulate what the rules are and uh, they understand those rules and they put them into your document, right? That's the key, uh, is make sure that you do it correctly. Um, and if the person doesn't understand or you don't understand, then you'll want to seek out a Muslim attorney who can uh, assist with this type of planning for you. Um, I'm going to take just a couple more questions and then we're going to wrap up. Uh, because this list is still very, very long. Um, how do you put your home in a trust? This is a good question. So this actually, this is not one of those things, uh, whereas I think you can make a will by yourself. Uh, I, I'm okay with saying, hey, if you want to do self-help on that, that's fine. Not a trust. Um, this is not something that you'd want to do by yourself. You can make a lot more problems and blunders. You know, we don't change our own oil most of the time. We don't do uh, simple things. Uh, so this is definitely not simple, and this is not something you'll want to just uh, try to figure out on your own. You actually have to do a deed transferring your property from yourself legally into your trust and file that and record it. Um, and so you want to make sure that's done um, correctly. Uh, what stipulations in a living will render it null and void? Um, I think the, the legal, the, uh, the, yeah, so the, the, it might be a state law question, depending upon where you are. Uh, but if a person wants to say, for example, that I, if I'm in a permanent, you know, vegetative state, or there's doctors say I don't have a chance of survival uh, or likelihood of recovery, and in that scenario, I don't want to remain on a ventilator, um, that's fine. Uh, and from an Islamic perspective, uh, you know, most scholars would say that's fine as well. There's no requirement. Um, and this, I think, is, a, is a, a brother will cost, I think, you know, having a whole series on um, end of life care and, um, you know, the Islamic bioethics uh, around that uh, is, is worthwhile because these are really, really important questions uh, for a future presentation, inshallah. I'm obviously focusing more on the finances and the guardianship, um, but healthcare is very, very critical that um, we do this um, as Muslims in this country. Um, Stepchildren we talked about. Uh, well, let's talk about 401k and retirement accounts just for a moment. I've seen some of these questions. Um, and all assets need to be distributed per the Sharia, right? So um, 
you will want to do so. Now, again, you can name beneficiaries directly in there, uh, but they may or may not be correct. And so we may want to utilize a trust uh, for naming those beneficiaries. If you name the spouse, which is the default, um, then just understand that the spouse then has an ethical obligation to distribute per the Sharia. Um, again, which may or may or may not be great, uh, but at least as long as you both understand, then um, inshallah, it's okay. Uh, illegitimate child have a right to inheritance? Uh, I don't remember the answer to that question. Um, it's been talked about certainly um, among the fuqaha, but I don't remember um, the answer to that question. Uh, kafara is something you can do in your will uh, if you've missed religious obligations, yes. All right, I think we covered a lot. Um, so I'm gonna stop here. I know it's getting uh, close to thought on the East Coast uh, and I'm pretty thirsty. Um, so <laughs> so uh, Brother Wakas, you got any uh, other thoughts or questions uh, or Brother Mustafa, if there's something in here that was mentioned a few times that you really want me to cover, we can in the next minute or two. Otherwise, I think we uh, have covered a lot. Uh, I'm gonna put my contact info back on the screen in case um, uh, people want to email. Just, uh, I will just make a um, disclaimer of sorts. If you email uh, with questions, just know that it will take time most likely to get back to you. Um, so don't be discouraged. Uh, if you'd like to um, schedule an appointment, uh, you can do so by uh, uh, emailing uh, this contact information as well. Um, and so, and some of these questions are fit questions that I would really encourage you to talk to your local imam about as well. Um, these are things that um, you know they should be uh, they should be discussing, and you should. Um, uh, consult with uh, a scholar that you trust on some of them, particularly like, I think there was probably 30 or 40 questions about life insurance. Uh, so clearly it's an important topic. Um, that's one you'll want to consult uh, with the ulama. And inshallah, we'll have subsequent sessions where we can go into more detail on some of these topics as well. So with that, inshallah, I'm going to go ahead and stop here. And again, uh, thank you for joining and thank you for being uh, so engaged. Um, although I can't see <laughs> you, it's a one way, uh, stream we can clearly tell mashallah that uh, everyone's very engaged in the topic and interested and in, and and looking to fulfill their religious obligations and this is a sign of iman and uh we pray to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gives us the uh reward for attending and he gives us the ability to implement that which we learned and that he blesses each and every one of us in these mubarak days of ramadan and has mercy on us and forgives us and uh, makes us people who leave a legacy uh, for our future generations and for institutions uh, for generations to come. Ameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Subhanahu wa rabbika rabbil izzati wa amma yasitun. Wa salamu ala al-mursaleen. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa jazakumullahu khayran. And I will pass it back over to Brother Waqas. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Jazakumullahu khayr, Brother Yasser, for that excellent presentation. I think it was an amazing and very, very informative presentation. We've had uh, nearly 500 people join us live over Facebook as well as YouTube. Uh, we've received um, uh, probably hundreds of questions uh, and uh, uh, you, you did an amazing job in uh, trying to um, answer as many as you can. Uh, I, I'm sure more questions will continue to come and uh, I encourage the attendees to uh, not just um, use the email to uh, send us your queries, but also stay in touch with the ICNA Council for Social Justice, uh, which strives to bring you uh, an amazing series of webinars on critical topics, uh, important topics for the community. And uh, we urge you to support this organization. Uh, please do um, donate. Uh, 
uh, at iknacsj.org forward slash donate and uh, support so we can bring these uh, programs to you. Uh, ICNA Council for Social Justice has been uh, at the forefront of uh, uh, bringing about awareness in areas of social justice uh, in, in the field of uh, uh, poverty, hunger, um, uh, racism, uh, issues uh, of uh, importance internationally as well as locally and uh, we urge you to uh, support us and uh, continue to stay in touch with us. Jazakallah uh, khair. Once again, uh, the website is iknacsj.org forward slash donate where you can donate and for the California chapter iknacsj.org forward slash ca. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum.